Hello, it's time for us to uh, finish up this little short discussion of protection and security. We actually started on this in class the other day. And so I think we talked about um, some of these basic definitions about the CIA or confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which are the issues that we need to address when we talk about protecting information in both computers and communication systems. And then we talked about um, different kinds of security violations. So we can have breaches of any of the CIA ones. We can also have theft of service or denial of service. And we talked about an example last time in class of denial of service that I gave you for the company that I had consult consulted with that did the uh, photographs at the, the soccer games and baseball games and all that kind of stuff. And then the methods to accomplish some of these, one would be masquerading. In other words, we pretend to be something else, and that creates some kind of a breach of one of those, those three things. Uh, replay attack, where we take, um, we make a copy, if you will, of some existing traffic, and then we modify it, changing uh, perhaps the, the information that we're wanting to obtain or whatever, but make it look just like a, another message. So we're, we're uh, kind of doing the, you can think of that in some ways as a, what a lot of spies do, they pretend to be somebody else, sneak into a party or whatever. Um, man in the middle attack, we'll talk more about that one in a minute. And we can also hijack a session. Once somebody's logged in, we can take it over and uh, do what we want rather than what they were perhaps intending to do. So we talk about protection domains. If we looked at these three domains here, we can see that domain one has no overlap with any of the other domains. So I have a file in there that I can read, a file in there that I can read right. Um, the nice thing about that is if all the domains were totally separated and no overlap, then I've eliminated a lot of the kinds of possibilities for uh, breaches or, or other kinds of interactions. Um, sometimes, though, we have domains that interact because they have some resources that perhaps both domains need access to. Um, so we see an example here of domain two and three sharing writing to a printer, and that creates some potential vulnerabilities uh, because when we switch Protection domains, because there's overlap, uh, we may be able to exploit that, that overlap. So uh, OS is the part that, of course, has to provide these mechanisms for switching between these protection domains. And we can think of those as different user logins, for example, on a, on a shared server, like a Linux server or whatever. And then the user ID capability uh, is set on each of the individual files or resources, like the read, write, execute, and stuff like that. So we're only showing one, but that's because in that particular domain, that domain or that user ID, if you will, has those particular permissions for each of those resources. Um, so one of the things we have to be sure the operating system does is, as we switch these protection domains, we have to be sure that we re-authenticate the user. Um, like if you go to the ATM, one of the things that the banks implemented a few years ago was if you did a transaction uh, and then you finish that transaction, sometimes people would forget and they'd drive off without their card or they'd drive off without saying no on the final screen. So it basically left them logged in, and people would exploit that. They'd come up and say, oh, they stayed logged in. You sure I want another transaction. I want to withdraw $300 or whatever. And some of the early systems could potentially allow that. Um, or you left your card in, I'll start a new transaction or do a continue, and then I'll have to type in your PIN number again. So now all the, all the uh, virtually all the ATMs, at least all the ones I've used, certainly, um, you're required to put your PIN number in again, anytime you say, yeah, I want to do another transaction, whether your card's still in there, of course, most ATMs don't keep your card anymore, you just slide it briefly. Um, but either way, they ask you to re-authenticate before you start another task or another uh, transaction so that uh, in case you forgot to completely get out, nobody can uh, piggyback on that and take advantage and steal things from your so here we've built a protection matrix. Uh, and what this does is it shows for each of these objects or entities or resources, it shows uh, what activity is allowable in each of these three protection domains. Again, I think you can think of it as three different user accounts. And of course, the areas where we're most concerned is when there's an overlap. And here we see that the printer one is in the previous picture, has an, an overlap, same permissions across those two domains.
And here we've also included domains as objects so that I could switch between the domains uh, as needed. Um, now using the same matrix kind of thing, then we can create something called an access control list. And this is one of the ways within the file system that operating systems uh, can control access. Uh, notice the matrix is kind of large. It's kind of sparse, meaning there's not that many entries. There's a lot of white space. So we don't necessarily want to store the entire table. So what we would do then is only store uh, the column information with the resources that can access that particular, uh, or the domains, if you will, that can access that particular resource. Uh, so that's one way we could do it. And then we could also store the occupied rows only uh, with the domain. So there would be capabilities. What can be done within this domain? We can do it either way. So one creates something called access control list. So we associate with each object uh, which domains have access to it and what kind of access they have. So that way we don't have to store this whole table. We just store the ones where there is something. So for example here, you know, like a domain one, there's nothing in that column. Right. So, And some containers would have to store a lot, of a lot of information if all three domains had some kind of access. Otherwise not in Windows and, and uh, shared directory uh, kind of stuff. All or Active directory, that's a word I was looking for the other day in class. Um, use these access control lists to, to affect a lot of it. So the idea is uh, a particular process or whatever has an owner, and then if we look at the different resources like the files, in user space I could access it, the owner could access the process. Then in kernel space where I'm protected, I can look at the access control list and see what the different processes can do. So you can see here like for file one, process A is read write, process B only has read. Uh, and of course these would be lower level calls that would be made as well. So that would be in the, in the kernel operations. So this access control list would let the kernel know, hey, if somebody uh, tries to access file one, and they're, first of all, not process A or B, that's an issue because there's no entry for process C. If they're doing some other than the allowed operations, uh, then we would deny them, and that would be one way we would control and prevent any kind of a breach of access to the information that, that wasn't allowable. Um, so we could also, this same kind of thing um, could be done with usernames and roles. So I could, for example, have uh, a password file and only certain things can access the password file directly, like system administrators, sorry, system administrator, etc. Um, there also might be certain data files that then certain users with certain uh, roles, in other words, uh, for example, Bill might be in the group pig fan, and as a member of the group, he has read-write, and so do some other people in that group. Um, but then in a different role, uh, through a different group or whatever, he might be uh, have different permissions, okay? or other groups might have different permissions. Um, so we can also do it the way of talking about associating capabilities with processes. So here the list would be more associated with the process. So here we see that in the user space we have the three processes, again, their owners. And in kernel space what we have is what can that process do? So rather than tying it to the resources, we tie it to the process. So in this case, for example, process A has the capability of reading file one or reading file two, but has no capabilities associated with file three. Um, either way, we can keep this information either associated with the process or with the resource and the kernel can check every time there's some kind of access uh, to data or to information, it can check to see uh, whether either there's a allowed access or whether there's an allowed capability having to do with that resource. <laughs> now obviously, um, the benefit of doing it on a resource basis uh, and the access control list is we can then extend that to uh, processes that come from outside the current system, so they come over the network and a lot of that kind of stuff, which we can't do uh, with capabilities because that's be associated with processors on the running machine. It can't be processes on a different machine or whatever. So that's why a lot of the distributed operating systems and things like Windows and stuff uh, use the access control list style of interacting with things. So here's just some pictorial views of how some of these different uh, you know, attacks might occur. So the idea in the first one, a normal, a normal communications is there's a sender and a receiver communication going between them and the attackers out here. So one of the things that the attacker could do is pretend they're the sender. 
uh, over here. So then the they basically transfer the communication to go between the attacker and the receiver, but the receiver thinks it's the sender over here, because uh, that's sometimes called a man in the middle. So, and then it also can convince the sender that it's the receiver after some message traffic has gone back and forth. So basically we've inserted ourselves into the middle of that communication stream and can change information or simply just gather information at will that's the sender and the receiver I think are just going between between them. Um, so program, some of the program threats, and you've all heard of some of these, and if you're taking a security course, you're going to go into a lot more detail than we are here. Trojan horse, uh, this, these are all from stuff that's already in the code, so not uh, trapping information via communication mechanism or something like that. So Trojan Horse is code that's in a program that misuses the environment. In other words, the program's running. It launches off into a particular subroutine or whatever that then opens the door, basically, and gives access to the program to uh, programmers or to other code that are, that's outside the system. And there's a lot of different kinds of Trojan horses that you may have experienced. Uh, various kinds of spyware, for example, things that get <coughs> put in your, in your browser or that uh, attach on to other software that you install. So you've given an authorization, basically, to be on the machine. Um, some of the pop-up browser windows do the same kind of thing. And there can be uh, covert channels or, or uh, ports that are opened by software that let others in. Trapdoor. Usually this is used by a programmer to gain access to his or her code um, once it's been installed somewhere else. So it's not always malicious. Uh, sometimes it just gives them an ability to maybe turn on and off some features or to shut it down in the event that it's a runaway process or something like that. So the user uh, may have, for example, an identifier or a special password that was hard-coded into the code that circumvents the normal security procedures. That's a really common Trojan horse. Is that I mean, a, trapdoor is that you have a particular user ID and password that you've hard-coded in there that the code's looking for that's not controlled by your normal administrative tools that let the owner of the program, for example, set up user IDs and passwords. Um, logic bombs, programs that initiate some kind of a security incident only under certain circumstances. So um, you create an entry into the, into the program only if some, some particular thing occurs. Uh, like it reaches its 10,000th customer, or whatever that may be. There's lots of different uh, reasons you might want to set up different uh, logical reasons for something to open up at a particular time. And a lot of times these are used in transaction, you know, financial transaction or things when, the, when the, the amount of money that's involved reaches a certain point, so it's worth, if you will, the, uh, the incursion so the information about the financial transactions and maybe even the, the money itself can be redirected or in some other way uh, absconded with, if you will. Stack and buff, buff for overflow, these usually are handled by putting a particular bug in a program that forces either the stack or the memory buffer to overflow, um, which causes the program to attempt to terminate and then we trap it with a particular interrupt or uh, some other kind of routine that runs when that when that error occurs. And we know what error it's going to be. Uh, here's a simple example of some C code that might do something like that. <coughs> We've got a buffer size of 256. Now we create a buffer of that size. The string copy stuff in the buffer now. Hopefully most of you would realize that if I have a buffer size of 256 and I create a character array of that size, um, that goes from 0 to 255. But the problem is if it's a string, for example, since I'm doing string copy, uh, may not have put the null in there. So that's going to create a problem when it tries to write information into that buffer. It's going to write, if the information is exactly 256 bytes, it's not going to have space to write the null. That's going to overflow the end of the buffer, which is going to cause uh, an overflow to be triggered. This is what a typical stack layout might look like. So remember, it's a stack, so we push things on the top. So when, for example, I call a function, what happens is, first it pushes the parameters on, then it pushes automatic variables that are used inside a particular function, then it points, uh, pushes the frame pointer from main or wherever it was I just jumped from, and the return address, and then I'm inside of a subroutine uh, with the frame pointer currently pointing where the return address is, and then I undo these things as I return from the function. 
and we can force that to, to go out of reference as well. This is an example of causing that to happen with the argument list. System and network threats, so these are ones that have more to do with either system communication or networking. Uh, a worm, which basically uses a spawn mechanism, it's a standalone program that not only inserts itself into the machine, but will perhaps even travel along networks and, and install versions of itself on other machines. So it could be over the internet. Um, so exploits features in like remote access, also bugs in some of the uh, Unix programs like Finger and Cinemail that typically were only intended to be used on local networks. Um, usually there's some kind of a grappling hook program that uploads the main worm program. So it sends something across, it sort of detaches itself from the message that was part of the network transmission. Uh, and then on that new machine runs some code that goes out and uploads the main code. So uh, pretty simple idea if you think about it. Port scanning, I'm looking for ports that are open. Uh, <coughs> a particular range of ports that haven't been properly secured, that gets me into the system, and depending on the port, I may be able to open up other ports, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about denial of service attacks, and the idea there is just to overload the targeted computer, preventing it from using, use, doing any useful work. Um, and you can do it across multiple systems as well. So this is uh, different than some of the other ones. In the other cases, usually we're looking to gather information. Denial of service attack is, is just to be annoying. Basically, we bring a system down, like an example I was talking about earlier. We, we may end up actually shutting the company down. We may not get any information out of it, but we're just doing it to be uh, malicious, malicious mischief, if you will, things like that. So we didn't, we didn't break into anywhere. We didn't steal anything. We just made sure that nobody could use your particular uh, services uh, for some period of time. So it denied everyone else from getting access to it. The next few pages are just examples of how some different uh, sort of pseudo-famous uh, mechanisms have worked. So this was called the Morris Internet Worm. So it would do various attacks against different uh, Unix or Linux ports. Um, at least one of those would probably work. For example, it would then insert a grappling hook, and then it would go back to uh, a previously infected system or maybe the original host, uh, download the worm or ask the worm to be sent across the network and then once it's on the target system uh, it can do whatever it needs to do. And this is a lot of the ways that some of the things like the ransom, ransom viruses and stuff work as well. There's another one that's called the Win32 Conflicker Worm and so this shows you the different conditions that are required for that one to infect your machine from a pre another infected machine. We're not going to go through all these in detail. You'll study them in a lot more detail in the security class. Um, and there are certainly other ones as well. Those are just a couple of examples. Um, one of the things that we can do uh, to protect our information, uh, it doesn't protect somebody from necessarily gaining access to a system, but it may prevent them from being able to use any information they might gather. It's using, of course, cryptography type tools. One of those would encrypt uh, the information before and after we send it, maybe even while it's sitting on the particular machine. So it's of no use unless you know how to decrypt it. Um, and we can use it for a lot of different things. Um, one of the issues with cryptography in today's systems is that uh, we can't necessarily trust source and destination of messages, especially those that contain, for example, financial information or other sensitive information if we didn't use cryptography because we, we have that man-in-the-middle kind of issue and things like that where we don't know where it actually came from. Um, so the idea is to constrain or prevent potential senders or receivers uh, that are not legitimate. And that's based on keeping secrets. And those secrets in this particular case we call keys. The longer the key, the more secure it is, the longer it would take to work. So the idea here, if we're going to do secure communications over something that's insecure, insecure means it could be compromised in some way. It could be as simple as it's a wire between your house and my house. So somewhere along, somewhere along that way, somebody could cut the wire, insert another uh, terminal, if you will, and then they could see everything that's going back and forth between us. So if that's an insecure medium, but we can still have secure uh, communication as long as we make sure that they can't figure out what it is. They can see stuff, but it just looks like junk to them. So 
the idea here, if we look at this sort of pictorial approach, is that we write a message in plain text on our system, and then we apply encryption with an encryption key to it, and then we send it over the network. On the other end, it's decrypted, and then it can be read in, in plain text. And the, the key, no pun intended to this, this particular thing, is that we have to have exchanged the key through some other means, in other words, not over the same uh, mechanism that we're using to communicate the information. We need to exchange the key uh, externally, if you will, so that the attacker can see the information that's going back and forth, but can't interpret it in any meaningful way because they don't know what the key is uh, to decrypt it. They also don't know what the key is to encrypt information so they can't pose as somebody else. So the encryption algorithm then consists of a set of keys, a set of messages, a set of ciphertexts, which are just encrypted messages, and there's some function that takes, using a key, it creates a version of the message uh, that's the ciphertext message, and then on the other end there's a function that undoes that, if you will. So it converts plain text to ciphertext, and on the other end it converts ciphertext to plain text. So the, these two functions, which are related to each other, based on that, that key. So that's the math-looking kind of version of So we can have, uh, so in order to uh, do this conversion, we have to know what the uh, key is. There's different kinds of encryption. Uh, this is talking about symmetric encryption. So we use the same key for both encryption and decryption. Um, and there's some algorithms created by the government and others that use fairly long keys. Uh, 56 was the original sort of the standard. Yeah, we use even larger ones, which just means it's harder to uh, decipher. Um, and there's some issues with some of the ones that have been around for a long time. So the work is constantly done in this area. It's a fairly hot topic of research and, and jobs and things like that. Um, so it's just showing how some of those work. I really don't want to spend the time to go through all of these. Uh, in detail because it's something you'll do in security. It's not totally important to uh, us right now other than to be aware that many of our operating systems may have to employ some of these mechanisms uh, to accomplish what we want to accomplish and to be secure. So this is the Diffie-Hillman. This one came about in around the early to mid-1970s, so it's been around a while. Um, it's based on using some logarithms, and there's an example of how to set it up, uh, if you will. Asymmetric encryption uh, is also in use a lot. The idea here is that the key is public. So you have two keys. You have a public key, which is published, uh, used to encrypt the data, but then a private key that's only known to the person receiving it that allows you to decrypt the data. And so actually these started out in some, in some cases as uh, uh, what was used to, like, during World War II and stuff with uh, uh, one-use pads. So was encrypted based on some public algorithm, but part of the information was also based on a private key, and so you had these decryption paths that can only be used once, uh, and then you destroyed it because every time you got a new message, it would have a different private key. And so without that pad, you couldn't decipher the message, and you also had to be sure that you, the sender and the receiver, were using the same pad, that one-use pad. Um, otherwise, the receiver couldn't decrypt what was being sent by the sender. And here's some examples of using public and private key and how to go about, in, how to go about encrypting the message. A public key can be distributed to anybody in plain text who wants to communicate with the holder. So I can tell everybody, use this key to encrypt your data, but each, we're each going to have a private key that we exchange uh, in order to decrypt the data. And there's a pictorial version of what, what that looks like. So in one case, the symmetric cryptography is based on transformations, whereas asymmetric is based on mathematical functions. So the asymmetric is much more computationally intensive, but we don't usually use it for bulk data encryption because it is so computationally intensive. Other kinds of things include authentication. So we can constrain the set of potential senders and on the receiving 
in by having some kind of way that they have to authenticate themselves. You know, we do this with people using user IDs and passwords, for example. We can do it other ways with algorithms and have it multiple sets of keys, messages, and authenticators, and each one has to authenticate before they attempt to, uh, to decrypt. And so there's a function that tells whether you're authenticated or not that basically results in either a true or a false. If you've authenticated, then we can uh, trust the decryption of whatever we're doing. If not, then we can't. And sometimes these are implemented with hash functions as well. And there's a couple other examples. Digital signatures. So this is one used in the web a lot. We have pages that have digital signatures, and if the information is assigned to that signature, then we know we probably can't trust it. And you actually get a digital signature uh, assigned from trusted sources. So you can associate it with your information or your page. Now it says here that you know being able to distribute the symmetric key is a challenge. So sometimes it's done out of band. That's a fancy way of saying that we don't do it through the network. And we do it some other way. Um, could be stored uh, on a device. Uh, it could be transmitted over the phone or some other mechanism that's outside the channel where we're going to actually be sending the information itself. Digital certificates is uh, used to prove who owns a public key. Uh, there's a you know, VeriSign as a public organization that, that signs those, if you will. So I receive proof of, of identification from the entity and the public key that I can use to encrypt information and send it to it. So this is what's used in most cases when you, for example, use your credit card to buy, to buy something from Amazon or someplace like that. Um, so they have a certificate that says, hey, you can trust me. You say, okay, what public key should I use? They tell you the public key and give, and give you a private key, which is usually associated, for example, with your user ID and password for Amazon. And then you send your credit card information. It's encrypted. Uh, and at the other end, um, they can decrypt it because they have the information from your profile. And there's layers we can use if we're doing things over the internet, like SSL, you're familiar with that, or HTTPS. So all these are different ways that we can use to protect information, especially when we're going over uh, the network. Now, to be, to be really um, secure, oftentimes we use several of these mechanisms. We call that defense in depth, multiple layers of security. So, for example, in your Linux operating system, you have to log in with the user ID and password. And then we have the levels of security having to do with uh, access control lists, you know, who can access and do things with certain resources. And then when we delve into the networking layer, we have various mechanisms, including encryption, uh, that, that are used to transmit information. And of course, you can also use it to store information. You can encrypt all the data on your hard drive if you want to. Um, and then there's various policies that are implemented to control who can change what, who can change the, uh, for example, access, access control that's associated with a particular uh, domain. Um, we also need to periodically do vulnerability assessment. That's why when system insurers go through and do things like, for example, say, oh gosh, um, we've got a bunch of ports that aren't being used by any applications on this particular server, but they are potentially could be exploited by someone. So we're going to close those ports down because we're not using them. The only ones we're going to leave open are like, you know, HTTP for web pages and maybe uh, something for file transfer, like an FTP port or something like that. Um, you can also try to detect intrusions. So usually operating systems have things that are scanning for those kind of intrusions, uh, looking for signatures of certain kinds of intrusions. We also use third-party software to do this, like our uh, antivirus software that periodically scans uh, the disk, certainly, looking for things like Trojan horses and stuff, but also scans what's already loaded into memory uh, to make sure that something doesn't come in through something that was embedded at the startup or something that has invaded the system but hasn't been stored permanently in a disk file. Uh, we do have to be careful that when we do uh, detect some kind of intrusion that it's not either a false positive or a false negative and that we're not overreacting or underreacting. Um, we certainly all want to make sure we have some kind of virus scan even if we run it on a Mac, which is as, as susceptible. Um, and then other kinds of things that we can use to check for possible incursions, checking the, the auditing logs to see what user IDs are logging in. We'd be specifically interested in things like 
uh, accounts that, are, that log in at, at off hours, things times when most systems would typically not be in use, or doing unusual kinds of activity, or large number of tries to do the same activity with lots of denials, et cetera. All well, those are usually indicate some kind of probing that's going on. So we'd watch for those kinds of things as well. So that's kind of our brief overview of security from an operating system perspective. And certainly, uh, most of you will be taking some other kind of security class, at least one, even if that's not your specialization, uh, because it's probably required uh, as part of your degree plan. And you may, if you're interested in that, you may end up taking more. Well, you'll go into these in a lot more detail. We'll just realize that in most aspects of computer science today, security has become a bigger issue, that we want to embed security at, at, uh, at the point of contact, not just in uh, the sense of things like virus scanners and stuff like that. Okay, that's it for, for this lecture, and we'll see you again in class.